not on the air yet. Oh. There you go. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals meeting of February 12, 2020. If we could all first please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Roll call, please. Karen Shoup. Here. Jim Hebert. Here. Melinda Torrance. Here. Rudy Karen. Here. David Bork. Here. Chip Powell. Here. I think Jennifer Waters is absent. Okay. Good evening and welcome. I'm going to tell everyone this is a public proceeding, and unless the board specifically votes to go into an executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and to view all the exhibits that are being presented tonight. Please notify the chairperson if you are unable to hear or see the proceedings. The board works from a prepared agenda and you will take up tonight's items in the following order. We have approval of minutes, approval of draft findings from last month. And we have appeal number 2679 for 14 Kent Street and then appeal number 2680 for 395 Black Point Road. <coughs> in each instance, the burden is upon the applicant to demonstrate the compliance with each of the each, with each of the criteria and provisions of the applicable appeal. The board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. When all testimony has been heard, the chair will close the record and the board will adopt finding of facts for each criteria of the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary to meet the criteria. It is important to note that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria have not been met, the board must deny the appeal or the application. In many cases, the applicant or the landowner may have a personal problem which prompted the request of the variance. And please understand that it is not a legally relevant appeal, and no matter how sympathetic the board may be to the appellant's situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criteria, a motion may be made to approve the appeal. And if it is second, a discussion will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on the findings of fact to support a decision on that motion. A general vote will then take place on the appeal. If the majority of the voting members present to vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. And if the majority of the voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as the date and the vote was taken regardless of the approval of the written decision. And generally speaking, appeals for adverse decisions must be filed with the superior court within 45 days of our decision. And again, we remind everyone that this is a public proceeding and you have the right to hear and see what is happening. And all persons speaking will be asked to first state their name and address and affiliation. And all board members and interesting parties are asked to direct their questions through the chair. So first we have the approval of the minutes from the January 5th meeting. Did everyone on the board have a chance to review the minutes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Have any corrections, questions, concerns? I don't have any. I'll move to approve the minutes as presented. A second. All in favor? Okay, and then we have the draft written decision from appeal number 2678, which is the practical difficulty variance by Eric Johnson for 34 Evergreen Farm Road. And did everyone get a chance to review that? Yes. Any additions, changes? I don't have any. Have a motion? Motion to approve. Appeal number 2678 as written. Second. All in favor? Okay. Okay, so the first appeal that we have tonight is appeal number 2679, which is a variance appeal by Patrick, and I cannot pronounce your wife's first name, O'Reilly, which is 14 Kent Street. I do want to disclose to the board first that I did used to work with Patrick O'Reilly um, at the last law firm that I worked at. Patrick and I have not worked together in the last two years, um, but I do need to disclose that. I, I yeah. do not feel that it will alter my decision. This is a variance appeal from Higgins Beach, which we have had many of, so I don't think there will be any issues. I don't see any issues with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> and tonight we have... My name is Kevin Brown, Kevin Brown Architecture here, representing Patrick and Sue O'Reilly for their property at uh, 14 Kent Street. Good evening. And we're here tonight for a request for a variance to be able to remove the existing structure that's on the property to, to build up a more code compliant 
structure that meets to today's ca the character code for Higgins Beach, as well as many overlying um, shoreland zoning and other di um, zoning districts. It, the, the house is, uh, was built, the existing house was built in 1960, and over the years it, um, it's sort of falling into dis disrepair as it is now. Um, we've submitted some pictures in the um, in our packet, and we also have them up here. It's sort of the, a lot of the deficiencies in the house, the existing house, where it's you know we had a structural engineer come out and look at the property, and um, you know to find out that there's many um, it's not on a frost protected foundation, um, which and then the current house is actually sitting below the pr new proposed well, the proposed um, flood zone for that area which is up, gonna be elevation 14. Uh, the current house sits at about elevation 10. Um, so with, with the, you know, the, the client would like to, you know, build a new structure that meets all those, uh, all the, the zoning requirements as well as all today's codes, because the current one has, you know, it's got a stairway inside that's very sketchy to actually walk up <coughs> and as well as there's wiring, there's knob and tube wiring. It just would take an incredible amount of money to, to update what's currently there um, for a reasonable return. Um, so with our proposal, we are proposing to, to build a structure that has a footprint that is less than, it's equal to le less than the current footprint. Um, it's gonna be further away from the resource and fully within the, the, the site's uh, setbacks. And it's gonna meet every criteria for the um, the character zoning. Does with, that picture with the show the old structure? Yeah, so, okay. yeah, so the old, the, the new structure is the orange okay. shade, and the old structure is the, the sort of the cross hatch around okay. it. So you can see there's a wooden deck that kind of goes over the property, over the uh, property setback on the, uh, on the side of the, re where the Angel Creek resource is. Um, so our footprint, you know, this, you know, we're, we're Mac, we've been working with the town on the character part of it, the character zoning part of it, working with the shoreland zoning in terms of the 30% volume and square footage, which we're actually limited to how much we can do because of certain uh, design options that we have for the character code. So we're up between a rock and a hard place for what we're trying to design, but again, we're, we, there's still square footage we could use on the table, but we can't physically figure out how to do it and meet all the other issues that we have on the site. Um, but again, we're further away from the resource and with our proposal with the new structure. Right. Um. Okay. So what we'll do now is we'll go through the criteria, so I'll read them, and if you want to read your answers and elaborate, go for it. Sure. Um, so number one, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. A reasonable return does not mean maximum return. An applicant must demonstrate practical loss of virtually all reasonable use of the land if the variance is not Granted. Yeah, so, so to answer that question, you know, the current structure, as I mentioned, is, is, is not up to today's standards. To bring it up to today's standards would be very costly and I'm not sure there'd be enough space to get a co-compliant stair in the space because the current one is a four foot diameter. Um, as well as the new, the, if we were to, if we had to jack up the existing structure to put it on piers, like we're proposing to do for the new structure, um, we're not sure lifting it would be a, an option because of the structural integrity that it currently is in. Um, so that's, you know, so I think even before we would even, that we, we would, they would spend probably 100000 to $200,000 just to re rehab it before it was even lifted um, to bring it up and bring it up. It's just, it's just in disrepair, basically current structure. Okay. Uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property. Yes, yeah, so to reiterate what I've kind of written down in, in our answers for, as we, for in the application, the current structure style, I wouldn't say, contributes to the neighborhood is part of, part of the, the argument, but the, the other part of the argument is there, there are many other overlaying di um, zoning districts and constraints with the um, with the floodplains and the, the back dune and erosion that, that are impacting what we're able to do on this property. And all these zones that are impacting the property, is that 
just that property or the ones next door, do they, are they restricted by all these zones, Mr. Longstaff? Um, the general condition of the neighborhood is such that many of the properties are in the, the uh, erosion hazard area as shown with the cross-hatched orange area. You can see that that's, that's one condition that's pretty much um, applicable to many of the properties. However, I think the one thing that's unique about this property is its proximity to the highest annual tide. So there's a couple of other properties. This one at Seven Bird App is probably as close. A few of these ones on the border here are, are as close. But generally throughout Higgins Beach, you don't see homes that close to the, the highest annual tide. What that just basically does is it basically um, does not give them um, a compliant building envelope anywhere on the property. You can't, there's no building envelope that's, that complies with the setbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, number three, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood. <laughs> um, again, to, to sort of echo what I've written, the, um, the, the property is in the, C, the, uh, the CD CR1 um, character-based zoning area and you know our new structure will be to the T of you know what the new zoning ordinance sort of lays out um, and I think it'll enhance the neighborhood versus the current structure which is kind of an awkward shaped house. <laughs> okay. Uh, number four, the hardship is not a result of the action taken by the applicant or a prior owner of the property. <coughs> This kind of goes back to what we were just talking about, the previous question about the, the overlying districts um, and just all the different restrictions are making us, you know, that's kind of, there's nothing really we can do with the existing structure without spending a lot of money to, to bring it up to the, to the standards, the, the, um, the zoning, the character zoning, as well as meeting all the, the flood zones. Um, so that's kind of the, where the direction is that we would, like to go is requesting the variance to, to make this work. Okay. Does the board have any questions? Um, I know I do, but before I. I have a question. Um, so, uh, with the structural engineer from Structural Integrity that was hired, they stated that raising the house is it possible? Is it impossible actually elevating the house to perform any kind of work? I think it would be. I think that would be possible, but extremely expensive, not to mention trying to re reinforce it before, that was, before sure. that was done. Because that there's a cantilever, as you can probably see, that second floor piece that comes out, overhangs. Um, that, I would think, it, it, looking at that and standing underneath it is a little scary because the way it was put on. I think it was a porch at one point that was enclosed. And okay. that would be a fear because that, that doesn't, it's sagging pretty dramatically. Okay, thank you. Yep. There was also mention, I can't remember if it was what I read or what you said, but there's also mention of mold yeah, you concerns with the property. Yeah, there's when you go down in the crawl space, there's weeds and and moisture just collected underneath in the crawl okay. space and there's hanging down insulation as well as an electrical panel um, in the in that oh, crawl fun. space <laughs> in the flood zone. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, you can see the, the weeds on there. What, what's the history of the property? Was it used as like a summer rental before? I think an older woman lived in it for a long time, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay. okay. And it was built in the 19, 1960 originally. Okay. I noticed it was a personal representative's deed, though, so it probably was care. There was probably a lack of care towards the very right. Right. Uh, end. Yeah, the back stair is another one that you know, should be, you know, it's just kind of hanging out. 
When we talk about reasonable return, and my understanding is they recently purchased this property, and I would I would sort of maybe think that the purchase price reflected the fact that this property is dilapidated and it does need work. And so that, because um, it does not, I mean, it's kind of funny because I look at the pictures and I'm like, oh, this makes me think of my duplex that I bought when I was 23, and I rented it out, and I didn't get a lot of rent, but I did make money off of it. Um, and so, you know, I just, I'm kind of curious as to if there's really, because I mean, Scarborough has no rental sort of mm -hmm. regulations and things like that. So I guess I'm just trying to understand really how dilapidated it really is and if it's not available for any sort of. You know, it might be livable for somebody, but in terms of feeling safe in that space, I'd, I'd be a little leery about renting it out. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, can you even get homeowner's insurance on right. something? Right. <laughs> well, you must have. I don't know. know. Hi, I'm Patrick okay. O'Reilly, 19 Wilders Lane. I'm the applicant. Um, so we, we are, we did purchase this home uh, and we intend to move into it and have it be our year-round residence. We're not going to rent it or okay. anything like that. Um, it will be our, our this is our forever home. Uh, okay. That's the hope anyway. Um, there is uh, currently no uh, working heating system in the house totally at all. Um, the water's been completely disconnected. The electric has been completely disconnected. Okay. Um, it was in, uh, the electric was in such a bit sad state of affairs that when I had the pre-purchase inspection, um, they said, this is a danger. You should just disconnect the electricity from okay. the home. Um, so it's, it's very, very dilapidated. Okay. Um, the woman who lived there, I think, uh, I think she was in some type of hospice for several months before she passed away, but the home was, was empty uh, for nearly a year, I think, and she was uh, resigned. The, actually, he didn't mention there's a, you see it on that picture there. Um, there is a homemade spiral staircase that goes from the first yeah. floor to the second floor that literally I have to go down on my hands and knees because I, you, you, can't go, you can't get up and down it. Um, it's, it's very, very dangerous, the home in the current state. Yeah, it makes me think of the lawsuits I have at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like people falling down stairs like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I, I can see that it, it's it's really not safe. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, Patrick, would you mind one more question? So, I, you know, I noticed that the, the sale was just uh, done in November of this past year? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I think some of what surprises me a little bit is... Um, why this would? Why was this not negotiated or, or part of like this a condition of getting this approval prior to the sale or something like that? Um, I think we were one of eight bidders with gotcha. no conditions. Okay, just um, wanted to get that out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Do we have any other questions? No. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is open it up to the public. I don't know if there's anyone here tonight that would like to speak in regards to this appeal. And did we receive any phone calls or emails, letters? No, we had a few questions, but no written comments. Okay. Okay. And I will close the public session. And now the board will do their findings of facts and conclusions of law. <coughs> With a variance appeal, the land in question cannot yield a reasonable term return unless a variance is granted. Mr. Hebert, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you. Um, let's start with uh, there's a few things here, but for one, Mr. Longstaff said there's no real building envelope that can be accommodated with this lot currently. Um, just due to the fact of how much that this lot is inside of the inside of the zone, um, because it's totally within the 75 foot shoreland setback, um, the non-code compliant staircase, um, there is an issue there that has to be addressed. Um, any kind of reasonable return, gutting the house to redo all the electrical uh, inside with the knob and tube wire and replacing it with code compliant insulated wires, that's a significant burden, um, as well as attempting to raise the existing house in its condition. Uh, it was pointed out that um, there's the overhang on one side of the building that is a real uh, danger and potential issue there. Um, so there really isn't much that they can do at all to this existing building outside of tearing it down, which is what they're proposing. So I don't really see an issue with this uh, criterion on this particular application. Okay. Mr. Bork? 
Yes, I agree. I think the house is <clears throat> uninhabitable and, and it doesn't make any sense at all to uh, try to do anything with the existing home. And the applicant has shown that, um, you know, that a, a different structure which would be otherwise uh, compliant other than the setback issue uh, you know, would fully meet the requirements uh, that we have. And I understand that the uh, town council is in the process of considering uh, altering the setback requirements. That hasn't happened yet. Is that correct, Brian? That's correct. Okay. So, you know, we don't know if that would happen or not, but chances are it could. Uh, we also know that this is definitely in a very dangerous area and any uh, catastrophic storm, and we've had s some of these events lately and there will be more, uh, could completely demolish this home and cause damage to nearby homes. Mm -hmm. So I think the only sensible thing to do would be to uh, approve this uh, criterion uh, and build a safe structure on this property according to the plans. Mr. Um, I agree. It's the property has just been neglected. And as a result of that, it's dilapidated and, it, and, it's, and it's a hazard. Um, I don't see a problem with it. Ms. Torrance. Well, to agree with the other board members, um, I, I see the continued existing use, which is really the primary use that is, um, is would, would constitute a reasonable return. And um, that continued use is, is limited, if not threatened, by the structural integrity of the property. So I kind of feel that this is, uh, this is a, a no-brainer as far as approving a, that the land in question can't yield, yield a reasonable return. Um, you wouldn't be able to build it today as it is um, and, it, and the way it's standing right you know basically the only alternative is to leave it standing exactly as it is until it is completely demolished at which time it doesn't have any value um, so uh, I'm in support of this one being approved this, this criteria Mr. Garren. I agree that with the current state of the building and the fact that it doesn't have a working heating system or logical system can't be rented out, uh, no profit there, uh, can't be lived in, um, no concerns. Madam Chair? Yes. If I can add one thing, yep. if I may. Um, I'll mention on this particular appeal, um, this first criteria is very difficult to try to provide a satisfactory answer for for the board. Um, noted that the applicants provided a licensed structural engineer as well as a registered architect and photographed evidence of all the existing deficiencies within the application. It's not something that they're just telling us and we have to take it as there were. They actually provided a significant amount of evidence in their package. Correct. We have the structural analysis. Well known. Which which showed us that they what, don't have a frost protected foundation and as the applicant testified tonight they don't even have the electrical on and they have no heat um, and I, I, I don't see how there would be any sort of reasonable return in a house that you can't even occupy. Um, all in favor of A being met. <coughs> the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general condition in the neighborhood. Uh, Mr. Longstaff was kind enough to point out that the property is unique in the fact that it is exposed to the highest annual tide, unlike the other properties around it. That was super helpful to me, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Hubert. Yeah, it's uh, completely in the shoreland zone, um, and it really, as far as from a character standpoint, doesn't exhibit any of the characteristic qualities of other homes in that neighborhood. Right, the Higgins Beach character. Mr. Wolk? Agreed. 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 Okay. So as we said, the property is in the shoreland zone, the AE-14 flood zone, the back dune and erosion hazard area, and is exposed to the highest annual tide. Uh, all in favor of B being met. Uh, C, the granting of the variance will not alter the essential <coughs> character of the locality. No, if anything, it'll bring it more in line with the character, um, the essential character locality. As and previously mentioned, um, the design Higgins Beach character code of how buildings are sort of generally supposed to have similar characteristics and how they're going to be looking like. 
Um, this current structure does not have it. If they did go through the effort of attempting to raise this building and restore it to a functioning structure, um, it would still really not meet many of all of the character requirements of the Higgins Beach Code. I agree. Agree. <coughs> Yeah, I agree. It's bringing it into increased conformity with the zoning ordinances and the character of the neighborhood. I agree. Thanks to the uh, renderings. Additional information that was provided tonight to show that it's more conformance than currently stated. Okay. All in favor of C being met. D, the hardship is not a result or of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Uh, it was not. As stated, the dwelling was constructed in the 1960s, um, before really any of the ordinances or regulations were put into effect. Um, obviously, when you purchase a home, you know what you're getting into when you buy a piece of property that is in such condition. However, for this criteria, um, it is not the action, result of the action by the current applicant. Uh, true, nor is it uh, the result of action by a former. There were no standards at the time, so uh, there's no bearing. I agree. Yeah, I, th I think uh, the hardship it, is, a, is a rising out of the zoning restrictions that are existing now. Um, 60 years ago, those that house was able to be built. Today, it would never be able to be built. Um, yeah, and uh, I think addressing the situation of you know what you get into when, when you're buying a house, uh, I, th I think one of the things that uh, I'd like to note is just that it's a good thing that we actually have somebody purchase, that purchased this house who has the financial ability to actually do this improvement um, and protect the neighborhood from existing failures that are, you know, potential failures of the, of the structure. Agreed. Time to change since the date of original construction. Oh, right. In 1961, there was no shoreland zoning, dune regulations, floodplain ordinances, or building codes that were in effect. So all in favor of D being met. Do I have a motion? Motion to appeal. Approve. Or motion to, I'm sorry, motion to approve. Uh, which one was this? What number was this? Thank you. 2679. Yeah, motion to appro approve uh, appeal 2679 as written or as presented. Second. We have a discussion. No. I have no additional thoughts. All in favor? Approved. Congratulations. The next appeal we have is appeal number 2680 by the Sprague Corporation. And it's an application for a miscellaneous appeal for 395 Black Point Road. And I'm going to ask Mr. Longstaff from the town to first give us a little background. Okay, I'm, going to, I'm going to keep my comments brief because I think uh, the appellant is going to go into some of the history of how we got here. <coughs> and
and uh, as you all know, uh, Scarborough Beach State Park um, is a busy place in the summertime. A lot of a lot of beach visitors have been for years. A relatively small parking area is associated with the the beach uh, uh, gates on that side of the road. To call it the southeast side of the road, um, it fills up and uh, and overflows. Um, and unfortunately, there is very little chance to expand that parking area on the same side uh, that it's on now because all of that land is in resource protection, um, which was established after the beach was established and the parking was established. So subsequently, we have resource protection parking areas uh, or development of any kind is basically prohibited in that resource protection. Uh, area, so you're limited to uh, lands that aren't in resource protection, and it so happens that the um, uh, the Black Point Resource Management Group uh, Spray Corporation owns a, a parcel across the street, which is um, heavily wooded, um, <coughs> undeveloped for residential use, um, and uh, somewhat available for uh, a parking expansion. The key here is to make sure that. Um, there is room for that overflow on those beach days when the, the heavy use occurs. Um, and I'll, I think it, it, the only thing I want to mention is they're here because there is a provision in our ordinance in Section 5 under miscellaneous appeals that allows the Zoning Board of Appeals to grant permission for parking to occur on a lot which is not the lot where the primary use occurs. I don't know why it's there. It's been there for forever. I, I've maybe never for seen this, another. Maybe for this reason. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, but it's there, and we haven't. I don't believe we've heard one of those in my seven years here. But now it's 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 here in front of you. Um, the tricky part is there is no established criteria that goes with that, as there is with some of the other appeals, like the one that you just heard. There's established criteria that needs to be met. So it's really, I think, up to the board to question the appellant. Um, and, and satisfy um, themselves, the board, uh, that this is, this is a sensible alternative uh, to what they've been doing, which I'm sure the uh, applicant will explain to you um, in more detail. So I'll turn it over at that point. Okay, good evening. Good evening, Chair Shoup and members of the board. My name is John Green. I'm president of the Spread Corporation. I'm representing the Spread Corporation seeking the miscellaneous appeal, as mentioned, for 395 Black Point Road. The lot uh, in question in, in total is approximately 60 acres in size. Um, as mentioned, Black Point Resource Management operates Scarborough Beach State Park for the benefit of the state of Maine. Uh, Black Point Resource Management is co-owned uh, by the Spray Corporation, um, and we are seeking uh, to use Spray Corporation land in this appeal. Uh, historically, the beach has, has used three lots for visitor parking. The lot actually located at the beach, and then across the street, the what we call the Gray Lot and the Harmon Lot. Uh, the Gray and Harmon Lots were used for overflow parking that could not fit on the beach property itself. Uh, instead of allowing vehicles to line up on Black Point Road and wait for available spaces, um, these two privately owned lots, the Grays and the Harmons, were utilized. In the summer of 2019, this past summer, the Harmons no longer wanted to have parking on their lot due to young children and a safety hazard. And um, later that summer, um, uh, Black Point Re Resource Management was notified by the town um, that the gray lot was also in violation of the town code, even though it had been used for many years. Um, the uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. The use of these overflow lots benefited not only the beach operation, uh, but the, the community in that area by moving vehicles off the road and into a safe place, uh, thus alleviating traffic jams, which have occurred in the past. So the uh, <clears throat> lot at 395 Black Point Road uh, was used as a temporary uh, situation with the loss of the previous lots in this past summer to alleviate traffic parking issues. Understanding that the use of this lot for parking is not a permitted use, 
we are now requesting that the town consider our application for such a use, use to continue to alleviate this parking problem in that area. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and go through your uh, list here of miscellaneous appeal items. Um. Well, it looks like you provided an answer for the justification for the variance. Um, and it looks like what you did here is maybe kind of list out the special exceptions criteria a little bit. Yes, I'd, like, I'd be happy right. to put yep. specifics to those um, yep. items. Um, why don't you read in what you have on your application here? So first I have B, the justification for the variance. In order for a variance to be granted, the applicant must demonstrate to the Board of Appeals how the proposed activity meets the standards and conditions required in order to be granted relief from the strict application of the terms of the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance. Please refer to and list the applicable standards and conditions, if any, for the particular type of miscellaneous appeal requirement. Yes, um, uh, obviously it's a rural farming district and um, the special, special exception number 17 allows commercial outdoor recreation subject to the performance standards of section IXU. Uh, when uh, referring to uh, section ISU, if I can find it here quickly, um, IXU uh, commercial outdoor recreation use must conform to a set of seven standards um, and we're primarily looking at number four the use must provide adequate off-street parking that is appropriate appropriate for the anticipated use of the facility that will prevent the parking of vehicles along public roads and uh, number six if the use will operate intermittently and intermittently for us would mean that we're using this lot primarily for peak use weekends holidays etc or will have an increased use on an intermittent basis. Parking for these times may be provided in unimproved or field type parking areas. So that is sort of what we're looking at um, in this appeal process. How long has the Black Point Resource Management Company managed the beach and the parking? Um, I'll ask to my Just roughly, I'm just kind of curious. Claudia, I have a rough idea of <laughs> and so since 1993 you've been managing this and when did you start doing the overflow parking um, <clears throat> we have uh, in this uh, application the history here okay. let me pull that up I'm sorry uh, did you answer it in your yes the okay. answer the history of Scarborough Beach I'm sorry I don't have I, I, I do not directly manage the beach it is managed by Greg Wilfert who is out of town at the moment it would in have Florida, been, <laughs> like half the people in Maine? Or out west, <laughs> let's say. Um, but the uh, history here, Greg started obviously when he was, uh, okay. I believe, maybe high school and has worked his way up managing that since, mm -hmm. I believe, uh, 1972. Uh, it correct. So, so he's it. been there <laughs> since Gladys Jordan days. And so what, what is the pattern here? I mean, are you seeing a general increase every year? Well, the popularity of the beach seems to be very strong and having the two private lots really was a benefit and to some degree, I wish I wasn't here and those two lots were intact mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have to go through this. Mm -hmm. right. But given the fact that even the loss of the one lot uh, and the popularity of the beach, you know, just requires us to look at alternatives. And since we do happen to have land adjacent right across the street, right. no different than the other two lots that were there. Um, we felt it was maybe an opportunity to help alleviate the traffic problem by providing sort of that field mm -hmm. uh, overflow parking um, area. So how, how many spaces did you lose between the two lots that were separate? Uh, we lost, um, the, the Harmon lot, we lost 128 spaces. Um, wow. And that was uh, through their own uh, termination of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the gray lot, uh, which if uh, was still allowed to be used or perhaps could go through a process like this, would be 160. Um, so together we lost about 288. Um, we have approximately 280 <coughs> spots at the beach itself. Um, we're only looking basically to 
given the uh, size of the, what we're proposing, this small area, trying to reclaim up to 114 additional lots. Okay, I, I don't leave Pine Point, so explain to me what's happening on, when it's really busy. Um, because it seems like what you're proposing is you're actually going to be stopping maybe people going past the entrance or kind of what happens when it's all built up and people are backed up along the road and they're trying to go in the lot or trying to cross the street because safety is going to be an issue. So I'm trying Correct, to understand how it's managed now and how people, I guess, pay for it and things like that. Right. What we're attempting to do is, is get people off the road, right. drive up a portion of this. This is sort of a virtual design get them off the road uh, and into a place where they could pay, where there's quite a line queued up in the lot itself so that uh, the people are off the road. 114 spaces obviously may not That's, uh, yeah. satisfy. Yeah. We're, it's, we're basically making an attempt with what we have. Um, and let's say this lot did not exist and, and we didn't go through with it and we lost the Harmon and the other lot. I would foresee, you know, this summer uh, quite the disaster with people parking along the it sides of the road. It almost seems like it would create more of a safety issue. Just hearing that you're going to be eliminating, I mean, I understand all, where all these spots were <laughs> not supposed to be there, it's not allowed, but correct. suddenly all these people are going to be showing up next year and there's nowhere to park. That's correct. And I feel like that's going to be creating a safety issue within itself and maybe more people parking on the street. Um, correct. And that's what we're attempting well, think, to alleviate, yeah. is yeah. to at least make an attempt to get some of these people in an area next to the sanitary district, you know, sort of like, you know, that field look, nothing, nothing different from what was there. And in fact, I'm not sure what uh, currently um, the issue at the gray lot would be, but whether or not we would go through a similar process to perhaps uh, have that continue to be used, I do not know. Greg is not here to answer that question for us tonight. Right. And at least, you know, kind of my sort of interpretation of what's happening here is before they were operating lots on residential properties where people were residing full time. And that's so now they're saying, OK, let's use a lot that we own and we are completely in control of and we are going to limit it to these amount of spaces. Correct. Is that, OK. Yeah. As somebody who's gone to that beach for years. Um, and, and and knows that, I mean, yeah, you do. You have neighbors that basically open up their backyards and say, go ahead and park for 10 bucks or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you've, you're going to have the traffic walking across the street no matter what. Right. You're going to have the traffic walking along the road probably if you have no, you know, if you don't have a parking lot per se. My biggest concern is you said you lost both the Harmon and the Gray Lots or you're not sure about the Gray Lot? Pretty sure. It is uh, against the zoning I, ordinance. Right, I, I be believe operating. they're both in violation, yeah. Brian. Okay. Mr. Longstaff might be able to answer that. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, so, so, parking on either of those lots is not a permitted use for those lots as they're developed in residential use, and, and parking yeah. for cash is a commercial activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> right. Whereas the beach is operated with a parking fee for, for years before that was actually a, okay. you know, a thing. Sure. But, uh, yeah, so we, we can't really, I don't believe but that there is any uh, uh, any mechanism for us to be able to approve through site plan review or any other mechanism the use of the Gray or the Harmon lot as a legal parking facility for the beach. Okay. And in our minds, and I, and I know some neighbors probably have a different opinion, but to me, I don't know why we never received complaints from the neighbors before, because those lots are, you know, right next to other homes and residences and, of course, the golf course and mm -hmm. stuff. But it just seems weird that we never got any complaints about that. We didn't, quite frankly, I have to plead ignorance because I'm from the county. We have a lack of seafront, oceanfront property up there. So beach parking was never really a big issue. I got down here and I didn't realize this was even going on. Oh, it's huge. Uh, because I'm not in town on the weekends. So I didn't see this, this happening. Uh, and during the day, wasn't I didn't have occasion to be down there. So I just, long story short, I don't know that there's any legal mechanism to provide parking on the Gray or the Harmon lot legally in, in accordance with our ordinance. Um, <laughs> Technically, I guess you could say the same request to have parking approved on a lot that isn't a lot of the primary activity, you might be able to, to use that, 
but there's already a principal use on those lots. They are residences. Yeah. There's no principal there's use no on principal. this. Exactly. Lot. So, uh, you know, one of my questions is is there is it possible to actually increase the number of spaces that would be allowed would be possible on this on the lot that you own with 60 60 acres that you you have you know can you accommodate basically you know removing the, the Harmon and gray lots and putting well we have <clears throat> excuse me we have an option um, that is not palatable us to us is that you know we have some agricultural lands that are already open that would lease to a local farmer and we prefer obviously to maintain an okay. agricultural venture there uh, as opposed to creating more parking but there may very well be an opportunity in that same area to push back um, more toward the sanitary district a little bit to create maybe additional spaces uh, we haven't really propose that at this point um, you know we wanted to get through the idea whether or not it, this use would even be considered before we went um, maybe through a planning board process where we would, might address more details such as that including safety that had been mentioned etc um, so. yeah I mean my concern is that you know with this uh, we've got a problem because there's always going to be a full beach on a sunny day Correct. And it doesn't matter whether there's parking or not, they're going to figure it out. They're going to find a way to get there. And really the finding a way to get there is that they're going to be parking on the side of the road. And, and it's going to get much sketchier as far as safety goes for pedestrian safety. And yeah, well, what you're going to hear, I know I'm going to just preempt so, yeah. everything that's going to come after this because what yeah, you're no, going to hear ahead. is there's no parking signs on the side of the road. Right. People don't I know. care. They don't care, exactly. I know. <laughs> they don't care. I know. But there I've is no it. parking. Legally, they can't park on the side of the road. Right. I guarantee they will. Yeah. Well, guarantee legally, they, will. they can't rent out their lots and sell for parking, but they did. So people do it. Yeah. No, um, I know. This is interesting. So the parking lot that you were proposing to do, what are you going to be changing to the property to accommodate parking? Will you be paving it? No. Um, we basically, as I mentioned in that uh, uh, section of the, that portion of the ordinance, that we want to maintain sort of that field approach no different than uh, uh, Harmon's uh, no different than that ie we we want when it's not being used to still basically look like a, an open field okay. we want to try to minimize any impact uh, improvement you know it may require uh, the planning board may require a few different things we, we've looked at site distances and all of that already uh, but we want to maintain more of an aesthetic uh, you know, obviously we'd prefer not to have that parking lot, but if we're right. going to try to alleviate this problem, we want to have it as sort of low impact as we possibly can as from that standpoint, i.e. a grass lot. Okay, so when I drive by, like on September, it's just going to kind of look like a grass. Uh, grass I hope field, so, yes, that's, right? that's the goal. Okay. What are the hours of Scarborough Beach? So, sunrise, sunrise to, sun to sunset, I think, okay, isn't so it? Or is it 6 p.m.? There's no real... I can't remember. Okay. Pass holders, okay. And they have to go into the parking lot. Right. Okay. Okay. Just wondering for any site lighting requirements if you're there at night, but if the beach is technically closed at that point. So, so the other th the other concern, and I'm trying to look at um, relative to the beach. So the beach entrance. You know, the, the entrance to the driveway that, that does on the beachside parking. Um, the entrance to this proposed lot, would that be like directly across from it, or would there would it be a little skewed off where they would have to walk along the roadway for a while? Right, if you look at um, what we're looking at on the large screen here, you can see the entrance here to the sanitary mm -hmm. district. That our lot would be to the right of that, and here is so basically just down the street a short bit. Okay, can you see what I'm referring to? I, no. no, can you blow it yep. up or anything? Um, Let's see, there we go. No. That, in that one there, actually that previous yeah, one you had also. There, that's better. There we go, right that's there. more what I need. So what happens now when the lot is full because they could just keep driving past those lots? Is that kind of what happened? Would you stop them at the entrance and say you need to park there? Or did people come in and circle right. out? That's correct. We would, there would be an attendant um, to direct people. At the entrance? Yes. Okay. 
So if you're proposing to put the lot sort of before the entrance, when that lot is full, is your intendant going to kind of try to redirect them? Before yes, so correct. That's correct. That? Okay. So that might alleviate some of the backup because they're going to be there going, just turn here, turn here, turn here. That's correct. Instead and and uh, I imagine um, if we go through a process, you know, we're thinking signage would probably have to be appropriate. Um, a crosswalk, uh, I, I imagine, at, at some location that is at, yeah. at its safest. And those are things that uh, we contemplate if we go through the planning board process. Uh, if this was approved, then we would be addressing all of those things with, uh, I imagine they'd have all those same questions and more. Yeah, and that would be my biggest concern is, is how do you get people from that lot to the other lot safely without... Uh, right. without incident and without impeding <clears throat> traffic flow too much as well. That's correct. And I'm, I, uh, I haven't really been to the beach myself. Greg would, I wish he was here, like I said, but uh, literally I don't recall any incidents uh, of people crossing from the Gray or Harmon lot. Right, that I'm aware, even doing it. That I'm aware of. Right, and you haven't yeah. had any problems. Correct. Right. Question. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And you, you briefly touched on it, Mr. Green, and thank you, but um, with regard to sidewalks and just sort of general traffic safety, are you aware of any existing crosswalks or cross the street lighting or cross the road signage there currently? There's nothing that I'm aware of there. Currently. Okay. I think that's important to note that there currently isn't anything on the street indicating for people to sort of watch out as people cross the road. <laughs> Yet they've been operating lots across the street for Correct. 20 years or however right. long, and they the, haven't had not, an incident. Not with saying the personal liability of, some, of putting all those people on the private property as well. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, applicants mentioned that the study of putting in crosswalks and signage and has been mentioned. Okay. <clears throat> I have a, a further uh, comment uh, to support that. It, this has been existing for years and years where people have been w walking across the street to parking, so this is really no different. Right. My primary concern, and we can't address this one because the planning board must do it, mm -hmm. okay, and that is the number of parking spaces. Mm -hmm. it's, it's completely inadequate compared to what you have now. Yeah. Uh, 114 is just not going to do it on a busy day. So there must be a way of being able to do it. I'm, as looking, I'm looking at the map here and I'm seeing that lot number uh, 17. It's a, it appears to be a wooded lot that's owned by Sprague. I have no idea how large that is or whether or not that could possibly be additional parking. And it seems that um, that's part, well, of, that the is part of that is part of the same lot. So there is a lot number 16 or 18, excuse me, uh, is, is a <coughs> home. Is that an existing home on, on lot 18? 16. 16. Oh, it's 16. Okay. That's also owned by Sprague. We need new glasses, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so 17 goes so out is with that, a big uh, What is that, a residence now? It is a residence. Yeah, it, it is, was, okay. Was so that, that, really, that whole lot is out of the question for any use at all. So there, you know, there, obviously there's potential for more, much more parking in here, but it would require some clearing of a of, of wooded area. Uh, but I think there's, there's definitely a need uh, in order to be able to just match what you've had in the past. Uh, but that's a planning board issue. It's not what we're doing yes. here tonight. Right. Okay. We're just simply here to say, yes, it makes sense to do this for safety reasons primarily. And we've heard from, uh, you know, the various town officials, you know, safety primarily, you know, police, fire, uh, and, and the code, code enforcement uh, folks that this is absolutely essential that we provide off-street parking for safety reasons. Mm -hmm. And right now, it appears that this is probably the only sensible option, unless you go completely off-site and use bus service to transport people in. I'm not sure how practical that is. Uh, but if, you know, if we want to be able to do something as close to what's been done in the past, you know, it seems to me we really have to do something that's right there. And the people have been crossing that street. If I'm not mistaken, the speed limit is quite low right there. Yeah. Uh, that's not an issue. I mean, if the speed limit were 45 miles an hour, I'd have a concern about it, but it's not. If I'm not mistaken, that's 15 miles an hour. I may be wrong. 25. 25? Okay. Yeah. And. It doesn't change until 25 goes faster. Right. So it's 35 at that point? Yep. Mr. Longstaff, I have a question. The application that they submitted tonight are proposing, I think, 114 spaces. Are we, if we do approve this, do we have to say we are approving 114 spaces, or can we approve it saying yeah, what's we the approve scope the use and we will let 
does it go to planning? It has to go to planning board. So do we second. have the discretion to say, we approve this use, but we don't want to say how many spots. We don't want to limit that. I think the important, maybe the more important thing is, um, and again, I'm, I'm going to preempt some of the comments I'm sure you're going to hear when you open it for public hearing. Um, I think the concern is that, that the neighborhood does not want to grant carte blanche to the Sprague Corporation to create parking at will as many spaces as they want. So there has to be, I think, a, a number. I don't know that this board has to come up with that number, and I do believe it's more of a requirement for the site plan review to negotiate what is the appropriate number and then issue that site plan approval once they've, they're satisfied that all the design criteria is acceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think the board could condition their approval upon there being a finite number of parking places to be examined and explored and, and, and uh, determined by the planning board during site plan review. You don't have to necessarily lock in on 114. I think it's helpful for the board to have that as you know, something to look at. And, and of course, I've heard the comments, nobody seems to think it's enough parking. I guess my question would be, if I was a board person sitting here and had the right to speak, which I don't, <laughs> um, have you maxed out the Harmon and Gray lots on occasion before? Do we know? Oh, yeah. It's great. I mean, so, so yes. both, oh, yeah. both the, the beach parking lot and the other two overflow lots have been maxed out. Is that a regular occurrence to get them maxed out? No, I mean, if you have a, On uh, a, beautiful a holiday Saturday weekend, Sunday, or... beautiful weather, uh, uh, all the, you know, yeah. I've seen Crescent yeah. Beach the same way. I mean, it's just filled with people. And, yeah, and I believe mm -hmm. you said you were losing over 200 and some odd spaces between those two lots? Correct. 288 is what I have right here. So, you know, I, I don't think anybody wants wants to, ex uh, to approve more parking than is necessary, but at the same time, I don't think it's in anyone's best interest for you, for if, if this was to be approved, for you to have to keep running back for additional parking approval. So I think I think that's a concern, and I think mm -hmm. there has to be a right size to this and a limit to it at the same time, um, because if you if the board were to approve 114, I would fear that that would lock you into that number, and should you find that it's still not working and creating problems for neighborhoods and we start getting calls and complaints that people are yeah. parking in private driveways and doing other things, you then have to come back to the board for more approval. And I think, I think this needs to be, again, focused on is this an appropriate thing to have parking on a lot where the primary use is not located? That really is the question that I think you guys have to, have to review and is this the property to do that? Right, and when it does go to planning, my understanding is the residents do at that time have a chance to speak then they when they start do. talking about specifically how many spots and why maybe we shouldn't have more or there should yep. be less yeah. or more or things like that. All right, I think the, the, a good point of engineers, we, we're all, none of us are civil or, or traffic engineers. Um, we shouldn't be trying to limit or put too many constraints on quantified, literal quantified spots. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, Mr. Longstaff, Mr. Longstaff stated that at site plan review, that's planning board. And the opportunities for any grievances at that point, that would be best heard at that. They are equipped to deal with those types of issues because Specifically. they do it on a regular, right. regular basis right. for any non-residential use other than a one or two family dwelling which they yeah, we're just here to determine whether or not they can. Exactly. So if I understand our scope, we, we actually could come up with a conditional approval that had some some of our concerns laid out for planning board <coughs> to actually determine based on that. Would that be correct? Concerns, conditions, I think it all kind of depends. Like yeah. when you're talking about sidewalks and, and, and crosswalks, I, you need like state approval to do those sort of things, I think, like right, DOT. So I don't, I don't think we can be like put a sidewalk in because that's, well, that's, why I say that's unreasonable. That's why I say concerns. Right, so because, I think we can say concerns. You know, we might just have certain advisory statements that we want to include in whatever our decision is. Right. Would that be appropriate, that, Mr. Longstaff? Uh, or no? 
I think that you can condition any approval okay. within reason. Mm -hmm. I think you could also issue comments and concerns or things that you hope that the, that the board will certainly take a look at. But I kind of think that's a moot point because I think they're going to do that anyway. Probably, right. but just. Um, but yeah, you can certainly forward uh, through the chair. We can draft. We could draft. Or I comments. suppose as citizens, we all have the right to or write our letters. <laughs> I think you should attend. Why not? <laughs> that's right. Um, um, I don't know. You know, I mean, I think you can. Yeah, I think yeah. you can definitely condition. I would just be cautious that your condition is reasonable Vaguely and enough. doable, yeah. flexible. Um, yeah. You know, I yeah. certainly can do it. I just, I, I would like to hear what those conditions would oh, be yeah. before, mm -hmm. before I can yeah. say for sure that that made sense. Okay. But I, I do think it's reasonable and perfectly right to somehow make an approval that has some kind of a finite number on it. I don't think it's your job to determine what that number is. I think that has to be done at site plan approval. I think, again, your focus is, is this the property based on this conceptual drawing? Does it make sense for it to go there? Does it seem like mm -hmm. people can cross safely? Haven't heard of too many people getting hit. Maybe we're going to hear horror stories. Maybe the bodies are buried in somebody's backyard. I don't know. But, but you know, I. I, I think making sure that there's a finite number and that all of the safety issues are looked at, is this the right mm -hmm. the right lot? That's where your focus would be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Again, we don't really have any criteria, but we think we're trying to cover the basis here. Um, does the board have any other questions for the applicant before I open it up to the public? May I make one more comment? Absolutely. I'd like to uh, just remind everyone this is sort of a process for us here. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, if this goes to a planning board, but I want to make it clear that you know we here tonight are not making any uh, idea that we're going to be clear cutting woods to create parking lots. I want to make that very clear. Um, this is just the start of a process to see if we can create something that may work and get into a planning board process where there's more input on all the issues you raise. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we at Sprague Corp and Black Point Resource Management, we, you know, will come back to our table a internally and discuss all of this as well. So, uh, you know, uh, there's some great comments and we'll take all that mm -hmm. in consideration, but I just wanted to make it clear that, uh, you know, we're not necessarily yeah. going to go the route of, of opening up a lot of land to create park and that just may not be in the cards. I would just comment on that, that it is still your responsibility to provide adequate parking. Uh, yeah, for, that's for, correct, for but the other option would be that we pare down, uh, in the worst case scenario, that the only parking available at Scarborough Beach would be at the beach itself. That's sort of a worst case scenario. Um, you know, maybe a lot of us wouldn't use. want to see that, but um, uh, depending on how things all shake out in the process, I mean, that is an option where things are just scaled down and it's sort of the economy of scale, it's a leaner operation, et cetera. So, I mean, there's many different options that are out there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quick question. This lot that you're proposing, you own it, 60 acres. Is it a residential buildable lot? It is um, 60 acres in the RF zone. It, it, and it does have a buildable? Uh, it, well, yes, the bulk of the property is outside of uh, uh, resource protection, so there it is. A uh, fair amount of it is indeed buildable. So I mean, if you can't, what is the purpose of this lot? Could you sell it and people could build a bunch of homes on it? If we can't have the lot, if there's no parking there. Well, we we, we like the idea of preserving it at this point. Okay, in time. just kind of seeing what, what what your plans are if you can't do parking there and what the intentions of the property was. When if people are like, don't park here, where well, there's nowhere to park, what's going to happen to this property if you can't use it for even parking? Um, I'm just curious. Nothing. Well, that's that's that's, a, that's an internal question for yep. Spread Corp. But no, our goal has always been to preserve properties okay. that we own, and that they've been that way for years. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If you have anything else to say, I'm going to I'm going to open it up to the public now. If there's anyone here that would like to speak, if you want to come up to the microphone, please. Yes.
Hi, I'm Lisa Miller. I live at 8 Kirkwood Circle, um, up the road from this. And I've lived there for two years. My parents lived there for years before that, so I'm the second generation, I guess. As I listen to the debate here, I think you're being presented something that you have to look, you have to look through a tunnel at it, a little paper tube, when actually it's this big. Mm -hmm. And I don't see how you could possibly come to a decision because you're not even allowed to consider all the facts. They're not presented to you, and they're not even part of your jurisdiction, I guess. Um, I'm really surprised this appeal actually got here, because to me, it sounds like it's way past time for an assessment to be made of the carrying capacity of that beach, of the park. Start with the fundamentals. How many people can it hold? 10,000? Well, you need a whole lot more cars to bring them there, or something. Or is it overloaded already? What's, what's the... Um, the durability of the beach. I mean, you have people running back and forth. Is there an impact that's permanent on that? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we have a you know, very so small jog yeah. here tonight. So we procedurally can't, it's not up to us if it's before us tonight or not. It's exactly. before us and we have to kind of take, actually, we can only consider the evidence that is presented to us tonight. Right. So if you may be right that there's not enough evidence here. I, we're going to make our decision tonight based on the evidence that they presented. So I, if yeah, you have I, more to I contribute. Think you, I mean, I don't want to tell you how to do your jobs, but if you can return this saying you don't have enough information to come to a rational decision or a complete decision or a, uh, a worthy decision, um, it seems to me that should be an option. If somebody's giving you a faulty, uh, if somebody brings you a, a meal in a restaurant and there's nothing on the plate, you're not going to pay for it. Send it back. Okay. Or put the meal on it. You know, it's, it's really that bare what I'm listening to here. You have very few facts to work with. And the impact <laughs> yeah. is you, you've all... Brian mentioned quite a bit of it, traffic, talking about, um, I think, 2,000 vehicle trips a day, somewhere around there. The level of service at the intersection of Spurring Road is probably level F on a summer weekend day currently. Uh, Black Point Road is not a large road. There's very little berm. There's a lot of traffic over most of Black Point Road to get to this. This is near the end of Black Point Road, coming from Route 1. There's a sign on the interstate that says Scarborough Beach State Park. You know, just keep pouring gasoline on the fire there. It's... Um, it's wonderful as a beach. You know, if this were a commercial recreation facility of any other sort, a giant tanning booth, they'd be parking cars around it. They should probably park their cars on the beach because that's the biggest place that there is. And I know that's not going to fly. I wouldn't want to see that. But unfortunately, I don't think the surrounding RF district, which is the lowest impact zone district in Scarborough, can support this kind of impact okay. right there. So. Thank Definitely. you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi there. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Peter Hart, 364 Black Point Road. I just have a question. This is a state park. I wonder, what does the state have to say as far as how the parking process works? And do they have, what's their skin in as far as the, the game goes? I mean, that's a really good question. The applicant tonight did not present information in regards to the state. Tonight we have an application from someone who manages it for the state. They are representing the state. This is, the, this, so my, I mean, Brian, please help me with this a little bit, but. I don't this know is, any more than you do. This is the representative from the state. This is the state park. You actually open up a lot of questions I had with like, my God, there must be a million state parks in, in Maine who are dealing with this. And you can't be the only one who's dealing with all this overflow. And um, honestly, maybe you should go back to the state and say, we have a great state park, and now we have nowhere to park. <laughs> you know, help us. My um, you know? My understanding is that this was a very unique situation with the Jordan family gifting the park under certain circumstances at some point. I think that was, if I, if I remember correctly. But okay. um, so this is a, an unusual state park in in some regard to that but um and and i agree i think there should be uh, you know but i think our our scope is really only to decide whether this is going to get in front of the planning board too and and have them right make, and to your point you know have them look at the vast the big no, picture I'm, versus you know the not, telescope sorry. yeah no and i mean it's really not an issue you are representing the state here and this is a use to use something within the Scarborough Zoning Ordinance. There is some commentary in the history of Scarborough. Thank you. Yep. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, my name's Marvin Gates. 
I live, my wife and I live at 423 Black Point Road, uh, stones throw away. Right. Um, in fact, full disclosure, I noticed in Brian Longstaff's letter that, uh, and you mentioned tonight, Brian, complaints. I would imagine we are the principal complainant, com a complainer uh, of the property at the uh, Gray's house, the parking lot. Uh, we, uh, I approached Jay Chase last year and said parking is going on. I don't see in the zoning ordinance where that can happen. And he, uh, not to say anything uh, out of line or out of school, but Jay said, uh, I've looked at the zoning ordinance and I think you're accurate. Uh, we have a real problem here though because people come down during the summer and they want a place to park. Uh, would you mind uh, uh, signing off on a letter that we're going to be sending to the Spray Corp, or at least agreeing to the letter that we waive this enforcement for the remainder of the summer? And I said, absolutely, completely understand people want to have a place to park. That's background. Um, I've been in communication with Mr. Longstaff back and forth with emails, and I don't know if it's cricket to uh, ask that the emails be put into the record, but if that would be appropriate, I would ask that that be done. And I'm going to speak, If you know, I'm probably going to take more time, but uh, I'll be absolutely as brief. I've pared down my comments to the absolute essentials, and I'm going to speak to the question of uh, the ZBOAs uh, authority as it's granted in the zoning ordinance. The comments tonight are about the, the use of this property as a parking lot. Again, I, I understand and I do, I saw your emails that you object to us hearing this appeal tonight. Is that correct? No, I don't object to you hearing it. I don't think that the, I think the zoning ordinance is a public document. Yeah. I mean, we can all look at it. And I think, I believe, I I think your ability to move this forward to the planning board is given to you by the zoning ordinance. And I think it actually hinges, at least as I understand it in the communications that you've seen uh, from Mr. Chase and Mr. Longstaff, I think it hinges on this idea that uh, to prevent cars parking on Black Point Road. And that would be uh, uh, 9U. Four. And the principal word in 9U4 is there are two stipulations that give you that authority. And it isn't an or, or an and or. It's an and. And it has to uh, uh, prevent parking of vehicles along public roads. It is clearly and frequently signed that there is no parking from. May 1st to September 15th. And if you are saying that because the law isn't enforced and practically speaking, you can authorize uh, the movement of this appeal forward based on what the zoning or ordinance allows you, which is to prevent cars parking, you in essence are saying, and forgive me, that because the parking ordinance are not enforced, we have to therefore say to prevent parking. I think you go back and you say, let's enforce the parking laws. You can't say, well, we're going to forget the enforcement of the parking laws and therefore to prevent parking on Black Point Road, we can move this forward. I'll sum up. I hope that makes sense. I just don't think the zoning ordinance technically grants you the ability to move this forward. I think this is an issue unforeseen in the zoning ordinance, hadn't been up before it. I think with all due respect and great humility, I would suggest that this is something for the town council to be informed of. And maybe all they have to do is change the word and, and, or, 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 and you're clear sailing. I'm not opposed to a 114 
space parking lot. I think there are real issues with crosswalks. I think there are real, real issues with sidewalks. I live there. Little children cross this road in oncoming traffic. And uh, it's an accident ready to happen. I'm not opposed to that. I'm shocked to hear that already we're up to 288, or I couldn't quite understand the numbers of the combination of the Harmon and the, I thought that was almost 400 and something between those two lots. So I think it's up to about 400. That's, I know nobody who's in favor of that in the community. I think the 114 is perfectly acceptable. And it's not us to say, it's really who writes the ordinance to say. I know you have a lot of concerns, and I'm, 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 yes. cu I'm curious about your feedback, because I think you've heard us tonight. We're actually, my concern is you're going from 288 to 114. I'm actually more nervous about the safety this coming summer if there's nowhere for the 300 people that are showing up. I believe you completely. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, not very, I'm curious as but to it's what an, you it's, feel it's an they, issue of, they should do. It's an arbitrary number. There's been no study speaking to this lady's report. Your concern is at 288. My concern may be at 114. Mm -hmm. Another person's concern, as the gentleman said, it may, worst case scenario, go back to zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's not really your prerogative. In all due respect, it's not mine. I know that. A proposal's been made, it's 114. I'm not mm -hmm. opposed to that. I don't think the zoning ordinance actually and technically gives you the authority to move okay. it forward. I think it's something that, okay. as I said, the town council should address. But your concern, I, I respect it, I believe it. It could be 500, it could be 1,000. We don't know, <clears throat> and that's not a ground to move anything forward or not, in my respectful estimation. Okay. And I'm going to stop there, I, I, mm -hmm. unless you have more questions. No, I appreciate you speaking. I know you guys have concerns. And I mean, we want to work with the residents. I think I'm actually, I'm trying to see, you know, is there an alternative? I, I'm having a hard time hearing an alternative. Um, I feel like we live in a beautiful place and we shouldn't try to eliminate people's ability to visit this beautiful place. For the Absolutely not. I think I think yeah. I think this. I walk the Scarborough Beach every day. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. I think, it, in my opinion, what it can handle, it can handle more than it's currently handling on the summer. The traffic situation's a nightmare. I mean, honestly. I but I really think you. Uh, this lady, uh, who I don't know, I thought had an. A, a, Absolutely perfect suggestion. This really should be addressed in a macro way and not inched forward. And if you find a means to promote this onward, uh, you know, I, we live in a world where precedent setting is an issue. I think you could do it again. And I, you know, I really think you need to look at what you technically are being asked to do and whether or not the zoning ordinance authorizes you to do that, even before making a decision. Again, I'm not against 114. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Murray. Hi. Kirkwood Road. Um, I just don't want you guys to go home and worry over the 280 spots because I'm pretty sure that annually in the summer, the two lots are not full at the same time, that mostly it's the Harmon lot, which was the 128. Uh, the gray lot is very seldom used, uh, and that, that's the one that you were all of a sudden I concerned about. Okay, so, so this happened. gray lot was sort of when the Harmon lot maybe wasn't available to them. Okay. So the Harmon lot, that was the one that caused um, a lot of concern when it was first uh, actually a um, an official overflow lot, right? And that was the kids walking across the street. I mean, that's the worry. So I think there is a sort of a, a very crude walk uh, crosswalk put in. Um, but but I just wanted to say that it's not 280. So you guys are all kind of worrying about this 280. Um, but I, I don't think that's true. No. The other thing is you have bikers 
and runners and walkers. And it's not just the traffic coming in, the beach traffic coming in, but it's all the other traffic, local traffic. Right. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Hi, I'm John Vincent, also on Kirkwood Road. Um, yeah, I, I find the uh, points being made by my uh, neighbors here, I think the number is important, or rather the number is not important, because at some point, no matter what parking lot you have, it's going to fill up. And if you don't have a sign four miles down the road at the fire station that says parking lot full, we're going to have people turning around. Black Point Inn now has a gate. You can't even turn around. There's no real way to even turn around down that road, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. when the, the lot's you know empty and the gate's closed without taking up traffic. So it's really um, a matter of no parking lot is ever going to be enough. So the parking lot that we have has got to be enough because people just don't get up early enough. They don't get a beach spot. They go to the next beach. I mean, the beautiful thing about Scarborough Beach is that it's serene because there's not a lot of people on it. So I don't see how the numbers make any sense. It's, it's at some point the lots are going to fill up. I don't understand how it's this corporation's responsibility to keep the cars off the road or this corporation's responsibility to provide parking for a state beach. Um, there is parking there that's working. Once that lot fills up, flick the sign on. No one even knows where to turn around. So why don't we turn a sign on at Route 1 or at the fire station? You know it's a simple matter of like people are going to want to go to the beach so you, you let them go to the beach until there's no more parking spots and then you know, I don't know what else to do I mean this is a residential zone um, specifically not for parking so there's a parking lot there add a couple hundred this is going to be another problem in two years or five years right. so again setting the precedent is the problem here that there's a parking lot I have, a, I have a question. How many spots are there in the official parking lot for the beach? It sounded like 200 earlier. Was that, was that the number that was 200? Oh, it was 280. For, for, for the beach itself. For the beach itself. And then these are, the, this gray lot, these are additional 280 approximately. I, I, I was given from writing the combination was right. approximately about additional. We have some people who may have more experience with what was going okay. on. Okay. Right, Greg is not here. He's the one that's been there, uh, unfortunately. And you've got no parking signs on both sides of the street. Do people park on the street? No. <coughs> no. They don't? All right, Wait, we, we're can't, not gonna, we can't, we can't be asking talk questions to us. at this talk point. Talk to us. Yeah. 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 No, you do bring up a point, and I mean, I, I hear that no one parks on the street and no one parks in front of the no parking sign, and I hope that continues. I, It's like... <coughs> People park in front of the no parking signs on Memorial Park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like, and so that's why I'm like, I really hope people do follow this because I see them not following it next to the police station. Right. Right. And I know that I am just as guilty of I'll just be five minutes and I'm going to park right here, <laughs> you know? Um, and so I think, you know, our thinking is safety. I'll also add to this, um, and it's precedence was mentioned here and the Zoning Board of Appeals in Scarborough is not governed by precedence. So what we decide on tonight could be something that we decide on differently next month. Depends on the consistency of the board, who is on the board, who is not on the board. Um, so we're not governed by precedence. So any future applications or appeals concerning this at all would have to be reviewed in the same manner that we're doing right now. And right now, we're not looking at exact numbers or, limita or limiting or determining what the perfect number of parking slots is in this area. Our determination here is with two elite, or currently illegally operating parking lots going away and someone offering to volunteer space to be used as a parking lot to benefit the community and everyone else using the beach, can that be allowed? All the details of determining how many parking lots or parking spots are available is done through site planning and planning board review with a stamped engineer drawing that actually has an exact logistical number of what can actually be put there after a study is of geotech and soil and survey and seeing what can actually be supported on that space. Our scope here, again, is just to determine whether or not they can allow this there. Right. 
do we have anyone else who wanted to speak tonight? Um, Mr. Longstaff, I don't know if you received any <coughs> letters or emails. No, uh, no. again, I had some questions. People <coughs> called with some questions. Okay. I provided them with some information. I provided them with copies of the application. Okay. I did not receive <coughs> written comments back or any other. Okay. If everyone <coughs> had a chance to speak, I'm going to close the public hearing. And now the board. Madam Chair, uh, I, you might want to just go on record as to whether or not you wish to have um, <coughs> Mr. Gates' emails. I, I knew he was going to be here speaking in person, so I didn't bother to forward private communications between him and I back and forth. I didn't provide them to the board. I showed them to you. Correct. Do you do you want those to be entered? And he's asked if they could be entered into the record. Do you want those en entered into the record? I don't see any harm. Um, I think Very it good. addresses a lot of probably the issues that maybe weren't fully discussed tonight um, in your responses to them. And then issues, again, with site plan review and planning board, they can have that information. Yeah. more better directly be better equipped to directly no, answer those right. questions here again we're just allowing whether or not this can exist in this area yeah, I support that completely it's, it's not really up to us to look at all those details you know we're just simply looking at this in terms of does a lot make sense here okay I would agree I think they should be read into the record okay because we also haven't had the the privilege of seeing them they won't be read in they'll be put into it it's very long long very long okay. email chain back and forth they okay. a lot oh, of I it see. they don't direct the, yeah yeah it's okay it, it, there was a lot of um, okay. questions and i think tonight we heard a little bit about the procedure and it being before us and again that's not something that we okay sure can you speak to I understood um so again we have a miscellaneous appeal so there are no criteria so i think we really need to put our brains together here and think about some findings of facts um so what I'm hearing tonight is that the, the beach has historically needed to use other properties for overload parking during its peak summer hours in order to, protect, to, protect, to pre prevent excess parking on the street or traffic. Um, I'll add finding a fact that um, the current parking lot there, official parking lot, um, is at capacity uh, during the peak summer, um, during peak times during the summer months, which has forced illegal parking to take place, which is one, it's unsafe because there are no crosswalks, cross lights, um, any sort of traffic protection in that area, no sidewalks. Um, parking is illegal on either side of the road, so you have cars just constantly going back and forth and back and mm -hmm. forth. I think it would be preferable to have the off-street parking on a lot owned and controlled by the Spray Corporation who is affiliated with the beach as opposed to having it at the private residence, which is what was operating before. Um, the use of the spray lock that they're proposing tonight would only be overflow parking on a temporary basis during the peak summer hours. So I think as we heard tonight from the residents, you know, the other overflow lots weren't always full or always being used. And so those are for the really the peak times. Um, you know, I think for us, one of the big things that we have for the appeals with criteria is, is safety. And I think, you know, numbers, you know, 280 spots, 180 spots, you have a very desirable location. And um, I don't know how I feel like there would be some sort of issues coming where suddenly there's 100, 200 less minus parking spaces. Um, you know, I remember going to 30 Beach once or twice, and you got to get there before like nine. And I mean, I don't know if that's what it's like at Scarborough Beach, but it just seems unfortunate to really cut it down to that and sort of limit people's access to it because of the situation we, they've sort of fallen into here. I'm really sorry. The public section is closed. Um, so, I mean. I'm in support of moving this forward for the planning board to review and make recommendations and decisions on versus us. I do feel like it is beyond our, our you know, our 
scope and purview to actually be able to do much of anything with this other than allow them to actually work with it. Right, and I understand the application we received had a certain number of spots. You know, I think that's just, this is what they're proposing. Um, we are not planning. I don't know this area. I don't know the resources. I don't know if there's a piping plover over there. I just, I feel like that's something that needs to go before the planning board because they're going to understand the situations and kind of what needs to be dealt with and they might have a better idea of the traffic and if people are parking illegally or if there have been instances or safety issues and things like that. Um, so tonight, you know, my, my suggestion to the board is if we do make a motion that we don't limit it to the size and we leave that to the planning board. Um, I, I agree with you, Madam Chair. That is, that is the role of the planning board in these instances to make the requirements of a traffic study, make the requirements of a stamped uh, civil engineering civil engineered survey drawing. Um, you can you can get uh, standard dimensions of parking spaces online and standard dimensions of what parking lot um, one way roads are. So it's easy enough to put a diagram like this together with some block diagrams on it just to get an estimated estimated idea of what your capacity would be looking like at that footprint. But again, it would have to be done. Um, it would have to be prepared on a stamped engineer drawing that the that the planning board and site planning will address, not us. Okay. You know, and we one of our criteria typically on our appeals is is it in conformance? Are they getting more into conformance? And I understand none of this is in conformance, but in my mind, getting it off of a residential property with a home is at least a step towards a little more conformance or at least when it regards to what the ordinance lays out um, and you know having a parking lot on a on a property with a residence it seems a little bit more non-conforming than having a parking lot on an empty lot and i would say on uh, uh, number one priority again being safety you're not having people parking on a private lot where if there were an incident to happen on that private lot, there are issues of insurance and liability that, that were to take place. Um, so yeah, just from a safety standpoint with no crosswalks, no crosswalk signs, no kind of street, uh, street signage or traffic lights or sidewalks or anything like that, um, that's a real serious uh, public safety concern, not just for people visiting the beach, but also for the residents who are, le who are living there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it just can't be a madhouse every Saturday in the summertime when everyone's trying to get there. Um, Southern Maine and Maine is, it's, it's a growing and more developed place all the time. Um, a lot of people are coming to visit here uh, and that number is only going to go up. So if we can do, if the town of Scarborough can move things forward in a, a thoughtful, constructive way, that's the way to do it. Uh, I would add to that, uh, that um, you know, if we were to grant this variance, we are not actually changing the zoning here in, in any way. Correct. Correct. Uh, we are simply saying that uh, we are permitting, you know, this particular lot, granting a variance <coughs> in order to, per to permit this lot to be used for parking for safety reasons. It's a very narrow definition of what we're doing. The rest is up to the planning board, city council, if they want to get involved. That's, but what we're doing is just simply saying, we are granting a variance for, for the use of parking on this lot, which isn't technically you know, allowed yeah. to have parking on. But we, can, we do have the power to grant that variance. Correct. And I think we should. Yeah, I think we're basically removing the zoning, zoning ordinance on this property so that the, the or temporary, you know, in some, we're not removing it, but, but we're, <laughs> we're exception. removing the obstacle of that for the planning board to consider it. I don't Sorry. believe, we're not making a decision on it. Um, you you would all be still recommended to go and talk to your planning board. Uh, uh, but this is, I, I absolutely agree. Okay. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve the miscellaneous appeal number 2680 as presented um, with uh, as presented, I'll have an amendment right. in there. Right. Second. Seconded. Any discussion? Uh, are we going to amend or, I would or, like or, or make any comment that we will remove any restriction from a number? Yeah, can we, um, well, there isn't, a, there isn't any, 
currently there's no number limiting right. on that at no. all. It's just a very it's very basic right now. Can we make a recommendation in this that can be forwarded on to the planning board? So I would amend the motion to include a recommendation from the Zoning Board of Appeals to the planning board that they um, study the effects of um, pedestrian traffic, local traffic, as well as visitor traffic in that area um, to see if any additional requirements need to be put in place from a traffic and safety standpoint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just to clarify, the motion is being presented to allow the use of parking and we are not saying how many spaces. Correct. <laughs> Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, what did I just say? I said, I said that the motion is to approve the use of the property as a parking lot, but we, the zoning board, are not going to be putting limits on the amount of spaces. We are going to give that job to the planning board. We feel that it is more appropriate and that is more along the lines of what they do in deciding. Um, and I think Mr. Hebert kind of spoke to the background and things that the planning door typically does anytime something like this is happening. And um, the residents at that time would be able to speak more about the, how many spaces and things like that, because they'll have a lot more information than kind of the, the appeal that we're considering. The detail, the detailed information of how many parking spots you can have, where can they have it, your actual footprint on this lot with your setbacks and how that looks and how that's shaped. That's done at the planning board level. That is not done at the zoning board of appeals level. Okay, so all in favor? We have a we have a first. We you had you second it. We did our yes. our recommendation. Recommendation. So all in favor of approving two six eight zero. Oh, good luck. Thank you. Okay. I'd make one comment, yep. um, and I am guilty of this as much as um, I've, I've seen it happen, um, but being aware of what state in the process that we're in throughout this appeal, whether the <laughs> applicant is up there stating, you know, stating their case, we can ask them questions and they can answer and they can provide back in any information. Once that's closed and goes on to the public hearing, the folks are out welcome to come up and we can ask them questions, just the people who come up. Um, but once that's over, um, really, really noting that folks from the audience or you know people from the public aren't allowed to ask questions and us answer. I know we've done that occasionally, and I am guilty mm -hmm. of that myself to a great degree. Um, but we need to, in general, be better about just saying that well, your time to speak is in this window here, because um, that just opens the box, the Pandora's box of now the entire thing is open and you start well, to lose that. And then that. I have to be mean and I have to tell everyone to stop the, talking. The, the Karen has to be <laughs> the worst chair we've ever done. No, just kidding. Um, oh. <laughs> and mean and everything else. But no, just just keeping in mind where we are and because yeah. that way we can always bring it back when this needs to go to a close. Otherwise, it'll keep going. So that's my well, and it's also kind of something to think in your mind was, I'd like to ask that person a question, but you know what, I can't. So when we're discussing it, you ask us and say, no one brought this to our attention. So then we can sort of discuss it and say, because you know, that might lead us to a no because we found a gap and we don't have enough information. Right. Um, or to so, table, to come right, back with an right. additional answer. Yeah. Or, or there may be a rare case, a very rare case, where we do have that clarified, but that should be a like all you know, the variances put before us, the exception and not the rule. I think, I think if, if everything is directed through the chair, that resolves a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, I think, too much direct contact. And again, everything's supposed to funnel through the chair, and the chair could then ask somebody to retake the podium yeah. for clarification. Right, because you're the authoritative power here. You can, you can make Well, I mean, it's just, it's just the order. It's yeah. just yeah. the order. Yeah. 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 But it is hard, because, I mean, these are our neighbors, these are our friends, yeah, I mean, these absolutely. are people we, yeah. we know, and so you want them to have the chance to speak, and you, and I think give them all bad, an but you also yes. have to follow the rules. Yeah. Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move motion. to adjourn. Second. All in favor? <laughs> and we are adjourned. Thank you.